We're good. Just giving everybody a second to make their way to their seats. Tony, Gina, good morning. Yeah, you got to shut those doors. Every once in a while, that back door, that sun comes in that window, it's like... <laughs> Luckily, today, I don't see enough, so we're good. Is everybody having a, uh, a good start to the week? Amen. Having a good, uh, had a good weekend? Yes? Just giving everybody a second to make their way to their seats. We'll go ahead and get started. Angela, good morning. There's my buddy, Perry. What's going on, Perry? <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to continue on with our uh, series of lessons on the church that we've been looking at. Uh, if you guys remember, the last couple weeks we're still in uh, descriptions. We've been making our way through all of these different descriptions. And do you guys remember the reason why I said we're looking at the various descriptions of the church? We're trying to understand the meaning behind, what is the nature behind the various descriptions of the church, right? We know that the church, right, it's the called out. We're the called out of the world. And we're called out of the world because we're to be what? We're to be uh, called out of bondage, right, uh, and, and, uh, to, and, and, uh, to Satan. We're called out of bondage to Satan. And we're called into freedom, into the freedom of Christ. So we're the called out of the world. Uh, we're to be separated from the world. And so that's part of it, how we started. We looked at the kingdom, right? We've looked at the kingdom of heaven. We looked at the, the origins. We looked at the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. We've looked at those different aspects of the kingdom. Now the kingdom and oftentimes are used interchangeably. The church and the kingdom oftentimes used interchangeably. Uh, we've also looked at um, the, the household, the church as the household, the family of God. And that's something that we really finished up with last week. And then and we started to just get into the body of Christ and what, what is the nature behind the body of Christ. Uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, 22 last week. You don't have to turn there because we're going to... You keep going past there, but it, it tells us in Ephesians 1, and he put all things, God put all things in subjection under Christ's feet uh, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. So we started to look at the church as Christ's body uh, last week, and we started to look at how Christians are the members of that one body. And how in Romans chapter 12 and verse 5, uh, it starts to talk about uh, the dedicated service that we have. But it says that uh, we who are many are of one body in Christ and individually we're members of that one body. And so that's pretty much where we left off last week. And so we're going to continue on with the idea of uh, the church being the body of Christ so we could really fully understand this. And if the church is the body of Christ and each and we're each individually members of said body, then each member has a work to do, do we not? Amen. And so it's to understand what is our role in the church? What is our role in the body of Christ? Does, has God given each of us various talents? Has God given each of us various gifts? What do you think he gives us gifts and talents for? To be used, right? Right? And so let's raise, let's raise our hands as we uh, go through the different questions. But each member has a work to do, and each member is essential to the proper functioning of the body. You think about uh, our, our different body parts, right? Uh, do they not have their own function, right? Uh, and so understanding what your talent, your gift is, and understanding where you fit in the body and what, you, what your function is to the body, it's going to really give you a new understanding of what your purpose is in God. And so what is our purpose in God? Think about that question for a second, Lewis. I want to say, Mark, Go ahead. That, but you're correct. We need to find out what our gift is. But there's a core value, there's a baseline that every Christian has. Yep. Whether, you know, whether you find out what your special gift is, Matthew 28 tells us again, over and over, if you haven't figured out what your talent is, don't worry about it. You just go ahead and preach the gospel. Yep. And in time, that will evolve into what you want to be and what I want, our purpose is for yeah. you. Yeah. And I, I'll never forget, you know, if you would have asked me years ago, well, you know, what my gift or my talent is, I would, I, honestly, I would have been like, you know, 
still figuring that one out, but uh, let, you know, get back to me and cir circle back around to that one, right? <laughs> but I remember, you know, years ago, well before I even thought about preaching, uh, I remember uh, Jerry McKinney always came to my house every Friday, and we had like 20 people from Sunset. We did a Friday, Friday night fellowships literally every Friday, and it was at, in our, my Dearborn house. And, and, and he said, Dave, if you don't know what your gift is, your gift is the gift of hospitality. Because I had people at my house all the time. We had an open door policy all the time. And I still have people uh, you know, at my house regularly. Every Monday we have the guys over, and every Saturday during football season, I threw the invitation out to the guys many times, and we have the people over, you know, the guys from the congregation come by, we watch football together. Mondays, we have the retirees that are hanging out together, right, and Jim, and uh, <laughs> the retirees and Jim, right? And, but no, we have, we have a great time. We have great conversations that uh, have an open door policy, and it's always been that way. And so it's really just as, you know, sometimes we need other people to be able to see what our gift is, to help inform us what we think maybe our gift is and our talent is. And so these are just different things that I think over time, as Lewis, was, I think, was saying, was until you figure out why, where your gift is, what your talent is, what your purpose is, you're still called to preach the gospel. So in the meantime... Get out there and start planting the seed, right? And so you, we've seen that in our Acts study when, the, when all the people were scattered, the Jews were scattered because of the persecution that started with Stephen. What did they do? They didn't just cower and, and fall in a hole and crawl down in a hole. No, they, 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 they were scattered and they continued to take the word out into the, the towns and villages as they were scattered to all these different places. And some of them ended up hundreds of miles away from where, where they were. And they found other Jews and they found other synagogues and they went there and they, uh, they, they went to their Jewish brethren and they continue to plant the seed. And so as we think about Christians, our members, we make up the one body. Let's look over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 14 through 22 for a minute. And as we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to see that each member has a work to do which is essential for the proper functioning of the body. And so this is so, so crucial to, to really understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's start in verse 14. And like I said, we'll go through verse 22. I'll give you a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting in verse 14, it says this. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot says, because I am, I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, is it not for this reason any less? Uh, a less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, is it not for this reason any less, uh, any the less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body, uh, if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he has desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And, or again, the head to the feet, uh, I have no need of you. Uh, on the contrary, it is much, truer than, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are absolutely necessary. And so what do you think we learn there as we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? What, what do you think Paul is trying to tell the people of Corinth there? In regards to the body, Christine? For the longest time when I first started studying the Bible, that was this was really hard for me to understand, but now it's easy because one can't work without the other. Yeah. So one member, so as a, as a whole in the church, one part of it can't function without the other part of it. Yeah. And so we need all members of the, of the body uh, functioning uh, with their gifts and with their talents uh, to fulfill the purpose of the church. And so it just no re the same uh, reasoning behind, you know, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, right? And so, and, and the hand can't say to the feet, I have no need of you. Because you know, if you understand the functioning of your body, that you have the hands and the feet uh, provide a great need, right, for, for the functioning of the body. And so no different than the eyes and the sense of smell and taste and all these different things. And so, again, we all differ, have many different functions, many different members, and yet one body. And so uh, we, we continue on. If one, members, uh, if one member suffers, we all tend to suffer. Amen? And that's the whole idea behind the, the, the even though we're many members, we're one body. When one celebrates, we all celebrate. If one's suffering, we all suffer. Why do you think that, what do you, why do you think that concept is there? 
If one suffers, we all suffer, and vice versa. Randy? So we do feel as one. So we do feel as if one body. If I smack uh, my thumb with a hammer, yep. you know, uh, my whole body hurts, not mm -hmm. just my thumb. Yeah. So it makes us feel part of that body. Yeah. It makes us feel needed and necessary. Yeah, and your heartbeat, when you smack that thumb, it goes, it goes from the heart to the thumb, right? And, and all of a sudden, you're like, you, you, you can literally feel the heartbeat in your thumb, right? Yeah. But we make light of it, but yeah, you're absolutely right. If one member is honored, then we're all honored, uh, just as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. And so there is complete unity within the body. The next thing I want to look at is we're going to move on to the next description, which is the church of God, the church of Christ, right, is, is God's temple. And so as we think about the church as God's temple, in the Old Testament, we know that the temple was what? It was a physical building where God's people came to worship. And we learn about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and, and following. But in the New Testament, are we, is God's temple a, a building? Or what is God's temple in the New Testament? Sherry? Uh, our bodies. Our bodies, yeah. And it's important to understand and to know where do we find those passages of Scripture. And so let's help open our Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. And there's really a, a few different places that you could turn there. Or it's going to tell us that we are God's building. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. I want you to notice what it says there. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And so you think about that. In the Old Testament, God, right, the, the Spirit of God, God resided within the building called the temple. But in the New Testament, God's temple is a spiritual building which is made up of God's people. And you think about that spiritual building concept and you think about um, us being the, the, the temple of Christ. Look also over to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and verse 16. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God actually dwells within you? And so it's important to understand these concepts because we see it over and over and over. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that, uh, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And so it's important to understand the, the, the idea of the temple in the Old Testament as, as well as the temple in the New Testament. And that's why it talks about how we are to uh, take care of our bodies, right? Because our bodies are uh, the house of the living God. And so we know that the Holy Spirit resides within us. Um, if you were to turn over for me to 1 Peter chapter 2 for a second, as we continue this idea of the church is God's temple, we're going to see that it's built up with living stones, uh, which are basically Christians, we're going to see in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, again, we're going over these different descriptions to see the nature behind the descriptions. So we see that in the New Testament, we are the temple uh, that God resides in. We are the living stones in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, where it says this. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Well, two things here. You look at 1 Peter 2 and 5. What are living stones? In the context of the passage, what are the living stones? We are. We are. Christians. Christians. Christians are the living stones. You also, as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. And you're going to see in one of the next descriptions that we're about to get to in a few minutes that we are a royal priesthood. And so you think about this also in verse 5 here. We are to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We know that in the Old Testament they offered up physical sacrifices. We're to offer up spiritual sacrifices. What, what does that mean? What does that look like? What do you think? Uh, Pam? Pam? mind is that if we sacrifice we're sacrificing ourselves to do God's work you yep. know, uh, our time or something uh, something else that's in our life that we are going to sacrifice um, you know something we want to do to do God's work 
Yeah, you're going down the right path. Lewis, you going to say something? Compared to the Old Testament where they actually actually had to kill bulls and goats yeah. to sacrifice God. So that's not acceptable now. Mm -hmm. I want you to be that sacrifice to the world. Yeah. And, and by the things that you said we do and practice every yeah. day, we show that. And we have been called out of the world. The church is the called out, right? The ecclesia. And we are called out to offer spiritual sacrifices. Flip over to Romans chapter 12. Look at the first two verses there. And you're going to start to see how this kind of comes together with us being the temple, the holy temple, uh, our bodies being the temple of the living God, and that we, the living stones, Christians, are to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, it's going to kind of tell you what those are going to look like a little bit. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Give you a second to turn there. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as what? A living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It's saying it's your spiritual duty to offer up these sacrifices. And it goes on in verse 2 and it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, that which is acceptable and perfect. So when you see that verse 1 there, and that we are to offer up uh, by the mercies of God to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship, our spiritual duty, what, what is that telling us in verse 1? Russ? It's a way of life. It's a way of life, right? We're called out of the world. We're to transform our minds. We're to no longer look, look like the world looks. We're to no longer live like the world lives, right? We're to now live for God and his glory and not for Dave Shostak and my glory, right? I'm to, we, remember we bury the old man of sin and we raise up a new creature, a new creation, right? For what? In service to the Lord. And that's why when we ask somebody, when you give your life to the Lord, are you, are you ready to now make Jesus the Lord of your life? And that's where that idea of that master-slave relationship comes in. And so that all I do, I, I offer up in service to God. So when we do, when I preach the gospel, when I do different things, uh, when I, uh, when I uh, do Bible studies with, with people, when I do good deeds, right, when I transform my heart and my mind, the way I think, the entertainment choices and all these different things, these are all uh, changing, transforming our lives in order to now live for God so then all glory could go to God. When you do good deeds and people say, why are you going out of your way to help me? You know, if you help somebody that doesn't really know you, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you going out of your way to do this? Because somebody did it for me. And his name's Jesus. And let me tell you about Jesus, right? You could tell him about your God. You could tell him why you're going out of the, your way because you too at one time were a sinner in need of a savior, even though we continue to sin. But now we have the blood of Christ that washes over us. Now the blood of Christ justifies us, makes us pure in the sight of a holy and righteous God. <clears throat> Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well that God is a spirit. Yeah. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. It's a small s. It's yeah. our spirit. Yeah. We must worship with our spirit when we gather together today. Yeah. Real worship means we're worshiping with all of our might and will and heart and soul and spirit pouring out our praises to God. Yeah. It's not a social event. No, absolutely. And to, to conclude this one uh, description, let's look over uh, to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 for a second. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, as we continue on this idea that we are, uh, our bodies are the temple right, of the living God, and that uh, we're sealed for the day of redemption that we've looked at, we know that, um, that uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, we talked about how we are the people of God, make up the, the, the temple of God. And that as living stones, as Christians, we are to offer up a spiritual sacrifice. But notice what it says now in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 19 through 22, through the end of that chapter. Ephesians chapter 2. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. What was it that made us strangers and aliens? Because it says you're no longer, right? He's writing this to Christians. So he's saying you Christians are no longer strangers and aliens. Well, why were we strangers and aliens from God in the first place? Sin, Sin right? 
sin made us strangers and aliens from God. And then also our heritage, right, kind of made us strangers and aliens from God. Because in the Old Testament, only the Jews, right, the people, uh, the Jews come from the tribe of Judah, right? And they were the ones who were God's people in the Old Testament. And so we think about this. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Who are the saints? We are, right? So you, people of Ephesus, they converted to Christ, are fellow citizens in the kingdom with the rest of the saints, Christians, and are now God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in, the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God and the Spirit. Do you see the idea here? What's the nature behind this description? That the church is God's temple. You, and then as we go through these different passages, and then you culminate it here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, and you can see how we're being built, uh, we, are being, uh, we are a whole building that's being fitted together, growing into a holy temple of the Lord. And so, brethren, again, you look at all of these passages, and the Spirit of God, we know, dwells then in that temple. And we are just, we as members are the, are the makeup of that temple. Lewis? I know you said you're going to get into the priesthood now, Nick. The next one, we're getting to the royal priesthood, yep. Yeah, but the word saints, and you come from the <coughs> yeah. background, and it is so difficult for us to realize that we are saints. Yeah. Either you're going to be a sinner or a saint. Yep. And that saint has such a bigger meaning than what the Catholic Church yes. put on it. Yeah. It's something you did and got sprinkled and you did yep. something. Miracle, or whatever it is. Our miracles are that way. Yeah. What we do every day as Christians, that sainthood yeah. is reflected throughout the world all the time. Yeah. And, and what Lewis was talking about the saints is that it's, it's very simple to understand. In the denominational world, the word saints are dead people who somebody, humans here on earth, uh, designate as saints because of maybe the type of life that they lived, right? Well, every time the word saint is used in the scriptures, it refers to living people. It refers to Christians. Not dead people that I get to decide, well, because I really like Sherry, and, and Sherry, you know, she lived a good life, and she's done some good things, uh, so I am going to elevate her to a saint, right? And no, that's, that's not what a saint is. That's not what the scriptures teach. Every time the word saint is used in the New Testament, it refers to living Christians, Right? Not dead people, but living Christians. And again, if you did good works, that's because you did your duty. You fulfilled your purpose. We're to offer our lives up as a living and holy sacrifice unto God. Well, that's the works. That's the deeds. That's that transformation process that takes place first internally in the mind. And then eventually uh, people could see it outwardly as we change our lives and as we transform our very lives. And so just never forget that saints are people who are alive and we're Christians every single time that the word is used in the Bible. It's never used any, any other way. And so the next, the next description and the final description that we're going to look at here before we move on to the next part of the, the study on the church is the church is a holy nation. It's a royal priesthood. And this is something that I, I, I know we hear it, but I wonder if we understand it. Right? We, we've heard the passages of Scripture many times, and so we'll look at a few of them here today. But in Matthew chapter 22, let's turn there first, and we're going to see what the Scriptures tell us there. Matthew chapter 22, verse 21. As we get to the, 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 the church being a holy nation, a royal priesthood, we have to understand that, first and foremost, that Christians are citizens of two kingdoms while living on earth. And so in verse chapter 21, it says this, Matthew 22 and 21. They said to him, Caesar's, then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God." And hearing this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. And that was one of those scenarios where they were trying to trap Jesus, right, um, about paying the taxes. And he says, he goes, 
show me a piece of money whose image and inscription is on it, right? He says, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God. And so as a Christian, you know, in, in, in that time frame, Christians were citizens of two kingdoms while living on earth. They were part of a physical kingdom. You know how I remember my monarchy versus democracy uh, sermon, you know, a month ago, whatever it was now? Um, you're part of two kingdoms in a sense, right? We're not actually under a king, right? We're a democracy. We have a president. But the point is, and I made mean, Jim smiling back there because some of our conversations, but that's a whole other thing. Not even going to go down that rabbit hole. But <laughs> citizens, right, we're, we're part of two kingdoms in a sense in the first century, right? Part of the physical kingdom in which they lived and part of the spiritual kingdom in which they were beholden. And so when you look at this, we are citizens of this earthly nation where we're born, but we are also citizens of Christ's kingdom, which transcends all national boundaries, which transcends all political allegiances. And so the church is God's chosen nation, just as Israel was God's chosen nation of the Old Testament. And as we learn about in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and, and, and Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. Look over to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 for a second. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, it's a simple statement, but I want us to make sure that we understand it. Actually, we'll start in verse 27 and we'll go through the end of the chapter in verse 29. Galatians chapter 3. The church is God's chosen nation today. And notice what it says here in verse 27. Galatians 3 and 27. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. And so we know that today the church is God's chosen nation for us today. And our citizenship is in heaven. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Why? Because he's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Why? Because he has all authority in heaven and on earth, all authority in the spirit realm as well as the physical realm. And so we know that the church is God's chosen nation today and that we are citizens of that, of that kingdom. Any questions before we move on? Thoughts? Lewis? The priesthood, you finished with the priesthood. That's what we're summarizing, right? Yep. Sometimes we are afraid to be recognized as priests. Yep. Because our Christianity makes us different from other people. Yep. In the Old Testament, everybody knew who the priests were. They had this uniform, I mean uniform. They had a robe, they yep. had all this stuff on their heads, and, and they always oh, a priest. It's kind of a uniform. Yeah. <laughs> it's a uniform of you. But God specifically <coughs> told them how to dress so they could be identified physically. Yeah. Even outside the temple. Yeah. Well, we as New Testament people, I can get away without being anyone knowing I'm a Christian. Yeah. I can walk in, in, in a bar and, and, and be a perfect Christian, but they won't see that in me. Mm -hmm. So the difference is, as a priesthood, we wear our internal uniform, but it should be shown externally by what we do. And that's a challenge to, to live out what's in us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you think about, uh, and as I just conclude this aspect of the church study uh, for descriptions, you know, we can learn what the church is, we can learn that the church is uh, what it's like by looking at some of the figures that are described in the New Testament, right? And so we know that there's types of things that you could go back and you could study in the Old Testament uh, that, that basically describe what the church is in the New Testament. So for example, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, well, it's really like 16 through like 21, it talks about how uh, eight people were saved through water, right? Well, if you go back and you look at, you know, baptism represents the water, like as we're saved through water, but the, the ark itself represented the church. Eight people were saved in the ark through water, just as we are saved through water, but the ark was a representation of today's church, right? The body of Christ. And so there's, there's lots of different types that we can look at. We know that the church is the called out because its members are called out of Satan's kingdom and were transferred to Christ's kingdom. And so that's something to, 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 to understand. It's a kingdom because Christ reigns over it as king. 
He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Christians are his subjects. The New Testament is his law. If you guys remember, I said there's four things that make up a kingdom. You have to have what? You have to have a king. You have to have a territory. You've got to have subjects. And you've got to have a law. And so we see that we are uh, citizens of the kingdom of Christ. We know that that kingdom, the church, is also referenced as a, as a family, as a household of God, because we are adopted and grafted in as children of God. We know that the body of Christ, um, it, it is the body of Christ because uh, he is the head of the Christians that make up, which are members that make up the body of Christ, which Christ is the head of. We know it's the temple of God, which is, uh, is built on living stones upon the foundation of the apostles' teachings. And so you can see how when you understand the nature of the church or the nature of these various descriptions for the church, how it really changes your mindset on how you should look at the church, right? Because oftentimes we often say, and I know this is just, you know, something that we do. It's a form of speech, but we say, hey, get ready for, we got to get up and get, get up. We got to get ready for church today, right? No, you got to get ready for worship is what you got to get ready for, right? Yeah, I mean, we're the church, but you'd be surprised not so much in the Lord's Church, because this is pretty fundamental, but really in denominations, you'd be surprised how many people don't understand almost any of these descriptions and the nature behind these various descriptions. And, and so that's why it's so important that as we have these conversations about the church and about its nature behind these descriptions, that we could then hopefully are taking these notes. You guys should have got the emails yesterday. I seen the email come across. So this week's notes, next week's notes are already included in there. So you guys are, you should, you'll be ahead of the game. So, and, and you could, when you print this, there are a lot of pages to it. So you could, you know, customize it and print only what you want, you know, because remember those binders are to be living and breathing things, right? I want you to customize them. I want, I want you to, uh, to, to make it your own. So that way, as you evangelize to people, you have a ready reference that you could use. And if you guys remember the, maybe a few weeks ago, towards the end of the foundational pillars, remember I kept saying you guys got to ask for the sale? Yep. Well, these last two Wednesdays, I went up and I did a high school class and I did a middle school class. And guess what? I asked for the sale and two people were baptized. Not because of me, but because of myself and a whole litany of other parents and grandparents and Bible school teachers and preachers before me who have all been planting seeds right into these young minds and hearts of these children. All I did was go upstairs and, and present it in a way that where they, they confirmed what I said and I asked for the sale, so to speak, right? I said, what hinders you then from coming to Christ? If you know that you're a sinner, you know that you're not a Christian, you know that you're outside of the kingdom, you're outside of the church, and you know you have to be baptized for the remission of your sins, if you were to die today, where would you go? And you'd be surprised when the tears start to form in their eyes because they have realization for the first time. And I said, do you want to be baptized? Absolutely, I want to be baptized. And so I didn't do anything special. I just built upon what everybody else, the foundation that other people were already building on, and then I just asked for the sale. That's where we have to get to as we're teaching and as we're uh, uh, talking with people is the realis realization that they are sinners in need of a savior. Yeah. And that if, I, if something, heaven forbid, was to happen to me, I'm not going to go to heaven. And so, again, all of these different lessons were building on each other. So I say all that to say that those, all that information we've been giving you and emailing you, that will walk you through bringing somebody to Christ. And if you use that information, use the scriptures, the word of God, we know, is what pricks the hearts of man. It's not somebody's fat, fancy speech. The Apostle Paul even said, I, I am not some great orator. You know, and, and he said, I'm not a great orator. He says, all I do is present the information that God, the Holy Spirit, has given to me and that I give to you. Yeah. Any thoughts or questions? Randy? David, I also <clears throat> believe and think that the verses that we've read this morning <laughs> should be a pattern for how we approach worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and absolutely can to, be. You know, we need to examine ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves yeah. when we come in this building to worship God. Yeah, and, and, and that's why I, I said a moment ago, I, I really, I wonder how many of us as Christians really reflect on the idea that we're a royal priesthood that we learned about in, in Peter's writings, right? Uh, we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, right? Uh, to, pro pro to proclaim the glories of God who has called us out of the world and, in, and, into, and into his light, marvelous light. 
And so I really wonder how often we understand the idea of a royal priesthood and really what that means for our lives. And, you know, because I know we, sometimes we look at ourselves as Christians and it goes back to a lesson I heard a long time ago at a lectureship and the, and the gentleman, um, uh, I can't remember his last name now, his, his first name was David, but um, he basically was saying, you know, if I was to ask somebody, are you a Christian? He says many people in the Lord's church and outside the Lord's church would readily say yes right away. But if I ask those same people, are you a disciple? And then there's confusion. They don't really understand what it means. And yet the word Christian is only used like two times in all of the New Testament. And yet the word disciple is used, you know, over a hundred times. And so they don't really understand the difference between what a dis the definition behind a disciple versus what you know, a Christian, being called a Christian. So I wonder how often, I often wonder uh, if we understand what the idea is behind being a, a, a royal priest, right? Uh, uh, being a part of a priesthood and how that we are to uh, take the message out to, to make sure we're living the life of a priest, right? Who is dedicated unto God, who is uh, offering their service to, to, up to God for his glory. Does that make sense, Lewis? The Church of Christ people, when I grew up in the denomination, I think it's in coming into the church. We've been so sheltered. How many have actually went across the street and walked into that Baptist church? Because that's, you know, we know that's yeah. not the right place for us. We have not experienced denominational worship in the sense that I have for 18 years, yeah. every Sunday, the royal priesthood, the, the pomp and circumstance. All those things are very important. And so I always, we couldn't walk up on the stage. And only a preacher and a couple of elders can get up there in the building, yeah. in, the, in, the Baptist, in the Methodist church. But that, that's the pomp and circumstance and, and the, the temple image that they had Yep. The building being the place of God. We weren't really taught that the temple is us. Mm -hmm. It was more the way you assembled, like you say, going to church. Yeah. So I, I sometimes at the, at we, a dis, we leave our kids at a disadvantage if they don't know what's yeah. really happening over there. Yeah. Uh, another example, just very quickly, and we're going to move on to uh, the next aspect of the church. And this is these are notes that you also have already. Um, I remember when I was preaching, and I first started preaching out in Iowa, and my mom was listening to some of the lessons, you know, and she grew, you know, grew up Catholic. Um, and she, she would ask the question, she says, why do you keep, you know, when you're speaking, you call the church, you know, you reference the church, you know, as like a people and not a building, you know. And I, and I, would, I would say something along the lines that, church, we need to understand that, right? And she's like, you know, she goes, the church is a building, it's brick, you know, bricks and mortar. And her, she didn't know what the you know, what the word church really meant. She didn't know what the scriptures taught. She thought when you use the word church, it references a brick and mortar building, right? And so again, many people, they don't understand uh, the nature of the church. They don't understand these various descriptions, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. They don't really understand the idea of that kingdom of heaven is origins. The kingdom of God, the father is the architect. The kingdom of Christ is the builder, it's the foundation, right? Is the it, the, the foundational stone, so the cornerstone. People don't understand many of these different descriptions. And so that's just something that I wanted to go, go through as we went through this. The next idea that we're going to look at is the church is, is the kingdom. The church slash kingdom we're going to start to look at in purpose, in prophecy, in preparation, and perfection. And we're going to see what that means. Uh, most of this we'll get into next week, so we only have about five minutes left. But by investigating the scriptures, brethren, we can learn four things about the beginning of the church. We can learn that the church was purposed by God from the beginning of time. The church was purposed by God from the beginning of time. The church was prophesied of in the Old Testament. And the church was prepared by John the Baptist as lo along with Jesus. And the church came in perfection on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at, uh, starting pretty much next week, uh, the purpose, the prophecy, the pre uh, preparation, and the idea of it came in perfection on the day of Pentecost. That, those are really uh, major concepts to understand as well. And that's why I said, you know, one example of the church was the ark, the ark uh, that, in which the eight people were saved through water. And so any questions, because we're just going to stop here because we only have like two, three minutes. Um, any questions about this? The, any, any of the things that we've talked about either today or in the previous weeks when it comes to church, kingdom, thoughts, questions, before we close it down. Jim, did you have one? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think for us it's hard.
hard to internalize the idea of a Saul being priest. We don't really understand fully, you know, what the meaning of a priest is. Like, yep. What what does a priest do? What's their purpose? Like what are they? And, and if we go back and look through scripture, we, we sort of see this idea that our sin as humans has separated us from God. It's built a barrier between us and him. Yep. And it was the priest's job to take the dirty, unclean, sinful humans yep. and give them a way to interface yep. with God, who is pure and holy and can't have that uncleanliness in his sight. Amen. So it was the priest's job to purify the sinners yep. so that they were ready to come into God's presence. Yeah. And by the same token, when we look at the great commission that's given to us, it is our job as Christians, as those priests who yep. have been purified, who have access to God, to go back to that dirty, sinful world and to help purify them, leading yeah. them to the gospel, baptizing them, and prepare them to meet God. Amen. And so do you see, do you understand the importance then of, of these studies, right? Uh, to understanding the idea of the church as the royal priesthood. Uh, that we are to then go back out into the world. Yes, we are these priests, but we don't just uh, uh, sit around in the, in the temple because we now are the temple, and we take that temple out into the world in order to do what? To purify those who are separated from God, to, to act as that, that interface between us, uh, us and God as we take the gospel to them and invite them to make Jesus the Lord of their lives, which then purifies them of their sins, which uh, allows them to be sealed with the Holy Spirit, as they become the temple of the living God, and God then adds them to the kingdom. And so all of this is just little parts of the puzzle uh, to understanding the kingdom and the church. Russ, did you have something a minute ago? Nope, he said it. He said it? <laughs> you got two more minutes. Anything else? One little nugget is that if we don't do that, if we don't act like a priest, yeah. there are consequences for that. Yeah, for sure. It's accountability. And that's what we, we don't talk about much, is that, well, I can sit here and, 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 and put my money in church, and, and I, I close the building. I lock the building up, you know. And it, that's yeah, that's a service, but the accountability is you have a basic responsibility to go out and just talk about the Lord. Yeah. Jesus crucified. Yeah. I, uh, my dad used to say it succinctly: <clears throat> sitting in a hen house no more makes you a chicken, and sitting in the church house makes you a person. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I think I said it last week that too many people think that Christianity is five songs, a sermon, a Lord's Supper, right, and, and a few prayers, and then we go about our day. No, Christianity is Monday through Saturday. Christianity is what you do Monday through Saturday. It's that transformation process, and I'm going to talk about reputation here this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, well, I'll just save that for a few minutes, but uh, it, it's understanding who we are in Christ and then showing that to the world as we fulfill our purpose in Christ. Uh, Lewis, would you close us with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, once again we come and assemble before your great throne of mercy and grace. Thank you for the opportunity to learn a little bit more about your word so we can apply it to our hearts and be the kind of people that your son died for on the cross. Thank you to God for those who come to the Lord this, week, this past week, five people that are now members of your body, and we welcome them and encourage them to be strong in their faith. Thank you for our visitors who are coming. Thank you for our members that have come back to visit with us. Let us have this fellowship with them as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> 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 <laughs>